Thank you. Thank you. Terrific in introduction. <clears throat> they didn't want to interrupt that music either. <clears throat> um, for, for those of you don't, that don't know, uh, Dr. Williams gives a fantastic uh, TED Talk. <clears throat> you, should, uh, you should Google her name and, and TED Talk, and, and you'll, you'll hear a, a fantastic talk on, uh, <clears throat> on statistics. Uh, don't do it now, though. Do, do it uh, after, after I get, get done talking. <clears throat> I want to talk about joy and motivation. Motivation is that, uh, that, that drive that pushes us forward to take on new challenges, to, to work a little harder, to study a little harder, to, to learn more. It gives us the opportunity to discover things and experience uh, even more joy. Psychologists have taught us a lot about uh, motivation. They tell us about the importance of self-efficacy, uh, of identity, of ownership, they tell us about the important distinction between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. But one of the things that's been missing from the conversation for me has been, uh, it's been about emotions. It's been about pleasure. It's been about joy, the, the kinds of things that, uh, um, that, that uh, the feelings that, uh, that propel us forward. I've, uh, I've reached the, the age, uh, the storytelling age. I, pre I prefer that term to, to being called an elder. Uh, I've, reached the, uh, I've reached the storytelling age, um, so I get to tell you uh, a, a few stories. The first story I'm going to tell you is uh, about an experience in an undergraduate class. Now, the reference to Kobayashi Maru, for those of you that are, are uh, <clears throat> Star Trek fans, you know that uh, when, when Kirk was a cadet, he had a test that he had to take, and it had a no-win scenario. And, and so what did he do? Uh, he changed the test. Well, I was in an undergraduate class um, in radiation biology, and the, the final project for that class was to identify an unknown that was sealed into a little gel capsule. And the way that this would be identified is that it would be exposed um, into a nuclear reactor, one that looked something like this, and the, uh, what we would analyze is the radiation that was given off after uh, that sample had been exposed to the high neutron flux in the, in the reactor. My, my partner, uh, George, and I uh, uh, took our, our sample, and we get to go into the reactor. You wear um, um, hazard suits and suit up. And you get to go in there and give our sample to a technician who sends it down into the core of the reactor. When it comes back up, of course, it's radioactive, so we have it in a protective can container. And you go out through the uh, uh, multiple doors, we get to take off our safety suits, put our street clothes back on. And the, um, the counting device that we had, a 200-channel analyzer, was in a science building about a half mile away from the, uh, from the reactor. When we got back over there, um, there were other people, since it was the end of the year, number of projects. Uh, we had to wait our turn to get the, uh, uh, to get the counts. So the tension, the tension mounts. When we finally got to um, uh, look at our sample and the results coming off, uh, we used our digital plotting devices. Uh, back then, we used our digits um, to, to actually graph the, uh, the, the, the information. We used our digital plotting devices. And when we looked at the graph, we couldn't believe our eyes. It, it looked like breadcrumbs at the bottom of the graph, or, or looked like mouse droppings down at the uh, bottom of the graph. Uh, we were stunned. This was our, this was our you know, big project of, of the course. What could possibly have gone wrong? So we, we did some what if kind of thinking. What if that little sample tube was empty? What if that fool TA forgot to put a sample in and, and assign that one to us? So I did the unthinkable. I peeked. Um, I opened it up, and when I looked down in, um, I saw something that looked a, a little like this uh, figure. Uh, imagine there were just three, three small cuboidal crystals down at the bottom. Looked something like this. Well, that ruled out hypothesis one that it was the TA. <clears throat> now, it could be a number of things, uh, cuboidal crystals, but uh, we, we thought again, what if, what if it was sodium chloride? So what we did was uh, we said, well, how would that affect our results? What should we have expected? So we went to a big reference book. So this was before Google, before uh, being able to do it on your, your smartphone. Got this big reference book off the shelf and looked up what would be the properties 
of the isotopes of sodium and chloride. And what we found out was the likely isotope of sodium, sodium-24, would have a half-life of about 15 hours. The likely isotope of chlorine, chlorine-38, would have a half-life of about uh, 37 minutes. So we thought about the time we'd spent at the reactor, walking back over, waiting in line, and we figured that about four half-lives, maybe a little bit more than four half-lives, had, uh, had expired. So our, our isotope, or our radiation level, could be, say, 20-fold less than when we started. <clears throat> well, that didn't leave us uh, very much to write a final report, but George, being very industrious, he managed to get us another shot at the nuclear reactor. Now, this is huge, this is huge. How often do undergraduates have access to a nuclear reactor? So this time, though, we did things slightly differently. George went in by himself, he took the sample in, so he got all suited up, took the sample in, um, had it uh, uh, down into the reactor. When he brought it back up, when he brought it back up, he handed it through the door to the changing room to me, and I took it and went outside and I ran as fast as my skinny little legs would take me uh, that half mile back over to the science building, and I got it, since, since we'd reserved time, I got it into the, uh, the, the, the counting instrument. By the time the counts came off, George was already coming back, and we saw the, the data coming off, and again, using our digital graphing devices, our, our digits, we graphed the data. This time, I'm smiling, this time the um, data resolved into two lines which were consistent with the uh, isotope decay of, uh, of chlorine and, and of sodium. So we, we, were, we were excited. I mean, you, you have to imagine the hooting and the hollering. People outside the hall probably thought a terrible accident had happened in the, the radiation lab. There was so much uh, shouting going on in there. I mean, we were relieved. Number one, there was the anxiety. Number two, there was the extra, extra effort, extra thinking, extra work that had gone into that. But number three, th this is something that neither one of us would have done um, on, on our own. So it took working to, together. And there was the opportunity to have someone to share that with. And so it was just a, a wonderful, exciting, and, and joyous time. Uh, incidentally, uh, about a month after that, I saw an ad for, uh, for a position uh, in a nuclear fuel recycling plant and I actually applied for the job. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get the job. Uh, someone, else <laughs> someone else did, and, and you can imagine where my career might have gone um, had, uh, had that happened. But I did, go on to, I did go on to graduate school, and I want to tell you a couple of things about my, my, my mentor, uh, Howard Schneiderman. Uh, he, made, he made things happen for me. Um, he, uh, he knew that I had done some histology previously, and so he arranged for me to learn uh, electron microscopy from uh, an African-American uh, micros uh, microscopist, uh, Lowell Davis. Um, he arranged for me to meet with uh, uh, a visitor from Japan, Hiromo Okai, who was uh, on sabbatical, so I could learn a little bit more about insect cells. He arranged for me to learn microsurgery, Microsurgery on fruit flies. You know how small they are. Microsurgery on fruit flies from Elizabeth Gatev, a woman that had immigrated from Bulgaria. Uh, it was, that was really a diverse uh, and wonderful and exciting environment. But there's one thing that he did that just, it just drove me crazy. It just <laughs> wigged me out. Um, I would be in there working in the lab, be looking through the microscope or doing work, and he'd come in with a big smile on his face because he was just so enthusiastic. And he'd have some famous guest, somebody like Sidney Brenner or Sir Vincent Wigglesworth, and he'd bring him into the lab with a smile on his face and um, say, Cliff, Cliff, <laughs> tell Sidney about that new idea that you have for reinterpreting the data of or um, Cliff, show Sir Vincent the micrographs you took yesterday of the cell junctions. And then what he would do is he'd turn around and leave. <laughs> he'd leave me, this little kid from the reservation, there talking to a, a world-class scientist. I mean, <laughs> that just, uh, that was totally nerve-wracking. But, but in hindsight, what a vote of confidence. What a vote of confidence, because he didn't have to be there to hear what I was saying. In fact, he encouraged me and all the rest of his students to, to be open with our ideas, to seek out criticism, to pick the brains of these, these famous people and see how, what they thought of, the, uh, of, of our different uh, interpretations of the, of the data. Uh, not everything works as a graduate student. There were good times and there were bad times, but, but I'll tell you, with, it, with this man, when, when things worked, there was just unbridled enthusiasm for, for the science. 
You ever thought about going back in time and maybe giving, the, uh, giving yourself some, some advice? I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of where um, the older me, had I gone back in time, I probably would have discouraged the younger me from, uh, from doing something that turned out to be a, a, a very, uh, very good experiment. Tom Grigliotti, uh, the University of British Columbia, had isolated a number of mutant flies, mutant Drosophila, that uh, would be uh, normal at uh, room temperature, 22 degrees centigrade, but would be paralyzed at um, uh, 29 degrees centigrade. Th this fly wasn't paralyzed, I just took the picture and put it upside down, but that's my way of showing you that. At 22 degrees it was normal, at 29 degrees it was paralyzed. I was looking for a project and, and I had read somewhere, I had read that muscle development, normal muscle development requires uh, normal, uh, normal nervous function. So I thought, well, um, why don't I expose the developing fruit flies to that uh, restrictive temperature of 29 degrees and examine uh, the role in muscle development? Well, if the older me had gone back there, he just, shook his head and rolled his eyes. I mean, th this was naive on so many levels. Uh, that it was really, it was, it was a, a wacky idea. Um, for one thing, I didn't know when the muscles were developing. Um, the second thing, um, it wasn't clear that the paralysis was caused by loss of nerve function. Could have been something else. The third thing, I'd done a preliminary experiment um, to heat the larvae to 29 degrees uh, uh, overnight, and they all died. The older me would probably have been giving uh, career advice um, to, to the younger me at, at that time. But the younger me pushed on and said, well, okay, they died from uh, an overnight exposure. What if I just exposed them two hours, four hours, eight hours, et cetera? Um, well, it turns out that um, when I did that, four days later when the fly should be coming out, they were all stuck in their pupil case. They weren't coming out. I thought, great, they don't have any muscles. <clears throat> Actually, that wasn't the case at all. Uh, notice the, uh, those bristles on the top of the fly and around the fly. Those are very specific uh, uh, neurosensory organs. Uh, down here, the shoulder of the fly uh, shows some. We, we know them on a first name basis. We've got two humeral bristles and a nodal pleural bristle. Well, what I found in the flies that I dissected was that many of them lacked specific neurosensory bristles. What was even more amazing, I examined a different set and instead of having two or three bristles, they had a whole forest of little bristles. When I examined the eyes of flies that were treated 48 hours before the end of their larval life, they had a scar near the back of the eye. The middle picture was uh, for larvae treated 24 hours, they had a scar in the middle of the eye, and those that were treated even later had a scar in the front of the eye. That is a wave of sensitivity had passed over the, the eye. So I was seeing um, um, the effects of developmental processes, I was seeing the effects of, uh, of something else happening in the development. This, this graphic uh, summarizes a lot of information in which uh, virtually every day I went into the lab, it was like Christmas. I found a new characteristic from having larvae exposed to different times in development. So there was the eye feature, there was a multiple bristle feature, there was a loss of bristle features, all kinds of things. Later research, later research had shown that the uh, mutant in question, the shibiri, uh, and its human counterpart, the dynamin uh, protein, are required for endocytosis, the way that cells take up uh, material from the surface. And of course, this is important for nerve function. So indeed, the mutant did affect nerve function. But it's also important for the way that cells recognize signals uh, from, uh, from one another and uh, in, in development. So, so this project, which uh, started out uh, um, to do one thing, um, actually had a lot of rep repercussions uh, over the next 20 years. So I'm really lucky that the older me didn't make it back in time to discourage the, the younger me from doing that really harebrained experiment on muscle development, because this turned out to actually not have anything to do with muscle development. You know, sometimes just being in the lab is wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed working in the lab, I enjoyed working with the students, I enjoyed doing the experiments. Uh, sometimes I just like being there and looking through the microscope and let my, let my imagination run wild. So this, this fire dancer, 
is, uh, is something I saw down through the microscope. Uh, it's really the midgut, the midgut of a tiny fruit fly larva. So it's really pretty small. It's a midgut of a fruit fly larva. It's been stained with a fluorescent stain to, uh, to detect actin. Uh, there's no experiment there. There's no result. Uh, that, that's actually not science. But it was a good day. It was a good day. It was a good day to be in the lab. It, it was my reward for, for going to, to, to work that day. Uh, speaking of rewards, <clears throat> you know, certainly the, uh, the, some of the most joyful times that I've had um, is, is seeing uh, students grow up to be amazing professionals in their own right. And uh, here are some of the students that uh, work in my, my lab, many students, uh, three of them, uh, Lupe Garcia, Scotty Henderson, and Johnny Orozco. Uh, actually, Johnny didn't work in my lab, but he was a friend of the other, so he's my adopted uh, student. Uh, this is the three of them uh, when they were at the University of Washington uh, in their PhD program. Look how happy they are. Uh, UW must be a happy, happy place to, uh, to, to, to go work. Uh, Lupe and Scotty um, have continued on. They are now tenured faculty at, uh, at community colleges. Uh, Scotty continues to do research in the summer at, uh, at Friday Harbor Labs. And Johnny Orozco is an MD, PhD, continues to do uh, clinical research in the, uh, in the Seattle area. Um, so, you know, I've had the joy of doing experiments, the, the joy of discovery. I've had the uh, joy of just being in the lab. I've had the joy of having students and, and working with students and sort of living through their crises um, and, and their uh, wonderful experiences and successes. Now I want to tell you just the kind of the joy of interacting with friends. Uh, so how many of you um, share pictures with, uh, with friends on, on a cell phone? Okay, so, so do I. I. I was at a meeting much like this, much like this, uh, and uh, I was sitting next to Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado. Uh, for those of the, you that don't know, uh, Alejandro is an absolute star, absolute star in regeneration uh, research and stem cell research. I, I was excited just sitting next to him. And, and he was telling me about uh, um, picking up some planaria worms um, down by a waterway that he'd been walking along uh, early in the morning. Well, since I'm a part of the conversation, I said, you know, a few weeks ago, I actually um, found something in a mud puddle. I found this, uh, this, big, uh, uh, this big ciliate. And, and so I showed it to him on my cell phone. And, and I turned it on and, and it was good. And you know what? He said, ah, that's Bursaria trunculata. I mean, he knew, wow, he knew this on a first name basis. Uh, I was so excited, I, I probably forgot to eat my dessert. I mean, this, this was uh, um, um, a pleasure, a real joy of just uh, interacting with, with colleagues uh, at, at even a luncheon like this. The joy of discovery, the joy of finding things, the, the joy of working hard and, and actually having that uh, bear fruit. The joy of taking on new challenges, and particularly the joy of being able to share that with, with colleagues, both the, the, the doing of the work and, and sometimes just sharing the, uh, um, sharing the, the, uh, the fun, the excitement afterwards. To me, these, these emotions are important in terms of motivating us. In fact, uh, I would say that motivation is, simply put, the drive to keep having those kinds of good feelings, the good feelings of discovery, the good feelings of um, overcoming those challenges, and the good feelings of sharing it uh, um, with, uh, with our friends. So, so faculty, faculty, you know, our job is to make opportunities to prepare an environment so that students can have those experiences of, uh, of, of discovery, so that they can um, work hard, so they can work hard and, uh, and, and, and uh, feel the rewards of that, uh, of that kind of work. Now, students, the, the faculty can set, can set the stage, but it's really up to you. You've got to go for it. And remember, the, the harder the task, the more challenging it is, the sweeter it is, the sweeter it is when, when you get your result. Welcome to the conference. I hope you'll all enjoy this conference, interact, learn a lot. Come by the booths. Come by booth 602, where the HHMI booth will be. Meet some of my colleagues there. I understand that the older me will be at the booth and happy to give you uh, plenty of advice. <laughs> Thank you very much.